Hello. Super excited to be here in Dublin. And I have a really exciting announcement around the unification of data warehousing and data lakes. But before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit uh, about AI. OK, slides are jumping. Uh, so when we talk to our customers and people that are using Spark, what they tell us is they all want to be more and more data driven. And what's top of mind for them is AI. They want to use more data, and they want to use that for predictive analytics. They want to predict things. They want to use machine learning, and they want to make better decisions. That's the main thing that they're focused on. And if you look at this uh, list of customers that we have on this slide, it's actually mind-boggling. You can see that we have customers across many different verticals. And all these different verticals, there are use cases that are machine learning, predictive technologies, where they're using AI. And I want to focus on two of those use cases that I find really exciting. One is in the healthcare space. So Databricks works with a lot of companies that are in the healthcare space. And what they're doing in this case is Regeneron. They have 50,000 patients' electronic medical records. So these are records of patients and, you know, if they visited a patient, if a patient visited a doctor or if they had type 1 diabetes, they have all of that rec recorded there. They also have 50,000, the same 50,000 patients' uh, genetic records. So they have their genomes sequenced and then run that through Databricks and then figure out which genomes are responsible for which, which diseases. And they can then use that to make better drugs and fight diseases. So it's an exciting use case, and we see a lot of these. Another interesting use case is Riot Games. Riot Games is a gaming company. And uh, what they're doing is they're actually in real time analyzing when people are playing games and the dialogues that they're having. If it gets heated, they can then detect automatically using machine learning hate speech, and then censor that user or shut them off. So these use cases are really interesting, and they actually are really important for these companies. How are they doing this? So what do they do to succeed doing, uh, getting these use cases off the ground? So it turns out, really the missing link to get these use cases working is big data. And this is what connects my first slide when I said unifying data lakes and data warehouses with AI. Turns out big data is the key secret missing ingredient that these companies got right. In particular, those companies that know how to get petabytes of data that they have, if it's customer data, sensor data, click streams, and they know how to scale it on modern machines and run it through classical algorithms from the 70s, machine learning algorithms that were developed in the 70s and 80s, they will get great results. However, it turns out that this is really challenging and it's not easy. And I'm going to have a slide here that's the same as you saw from Matt's talk. Um, this is a paper, a research paper by Google. And Google looked at all their different AI use cases that they have. And they looked at where are they spending their efforts when they're building these AI applications. And the boxes here indicate the different activities that they had to do to get AI working. And the size of the box indicates the amount of effort that went into it. And as you can see, there is a small little black box there, as Matt pointed to, that says machine learning code. So according to Google, most of their AI projects, they're spending very little time on artificial intelligence or machine learning. Most of their time is actually spent on this, all this other stuff. So in other words, the hardest part of AI isn't AI. The hardest part of AI for Google is the big data processing, all this other stuff. OK, so I want to take you through a journey of what the data landscape have looked like over the last 30, 40 years and see why it's so challenging to do this data processing. Why is big data so hard? So it all started in the 70s when companies had all this data in their databases about how their products were doing and different uh, revenue in different regions, but they couldn't actually put it all together. They were flying blind. And people came up with this concept of a data warehouse. And they said, let's do this. Let's take the most important data that you have in your different databases. Let's ETL them all into a central data warehouse. We'll make it really clean. We'll make sure that you can rely on that data. And once you have it all stored in the central location, then you can plug in other apps on top of it, and you can get business intelligence out of this uh, data that you have there. So they built these BI tools and the data warehousing. And this was really awesome. Now these companies could do things they couldn't do before. In particular, the great things about the data warehouse was that the data that was in it was really pristine. It was reliable. It was uh, cleaned up, and it had a particular schema. And you could do really fast queries on it. So these were really performance systems. Because you had such control over the data that you'd put in there, you could actually optimize it and get really great performance out of it. And then finally, it gave you transactional reliability, which meant that you could have lots of different business analysts using these BI tools simultaneously and using concurrently the same data warehouse, and it just worked. 
no errors, no corruption. So this was a great thing about data warehouses, but this was 30, 40 years ago, and things have evolved quite a bit since then. And over time, people started to see the problems that these data warehouses had. In particular, it was hard to scale them. So this was good for the pristine small data that you had, but if you wanted to have lots of lots of data and you want to move it all in there, it was hard to scale it. It was not elastic, so you couldn't just say, okay, I want to double the size of my data warehouse. That was a complicated operation. And then it required this ETL to get your data into the data warehouse. That ETL process was very cumbersome, so you did it once a week, so hence the data that you had in your data warehouse was stale, and you were actually operating on old data. So it wasn't real time. And then most importantly, as I said, what's on the top of mind of all these companies today is AI machine learning. So here you had all your data inside of your data warehouse. It was your, all your customer data, all your product sales, everything you needed, but you couldn't ask the data warehouse to do predictions for you. You couldn't ask it, tell me what my revenue will be next quarter, or which of these customers are unhappy and I should reach out to them. The data warehouse simply couldn't do that. It just supported SQL, structured query language. And then finally, it was all based on closed formats. So once you had your data in the system, it was hard to kind of get it out. So you were locked into these data warehouses. So in short, it was not future-proof. It was missing predictions, real-time streaming, and it couldn't really scale. Okay? So what happened is about 10 years ago, the Hadoop vendors showed up, and they said, what you need is a Hadoop data lake. And what a Hadoop data lake will let you do is that you can now ETL all of your data. It's a scalable thing, so take all of your data and just dump it into this open data lake, and then you can do all kinds of use cases on top of it. Since these are open formats, you can get all the machine learning, all this stuff working. So all the problems that you had with your data warehouse will go away, and you get all these benefits now with the data lake, which is true. So now you got massive scale, so you could store petabytes of data in it. It was inexpensive. It was based on this open source Hadoop technology. And it was based on open formats like Parquet and ORC, so you could easily get your data and move it around. And it had the promise of AI, machine learning, and real-time streaming. So that was really great. People got really excited and started storing all their data in these data, data lakes. And over the last 10 years, they've been storing more and more of this data. And you know, many enterprises would go talk to say, I have a petabyte now, or I have five petabytes of data in this. So now, they've gone to the point where they actually want to deploy these applications, these aspirational AI applications, and they're running into a lot of trouble. So the problem now that you have with the data lakes is kind of the same things that were the advantages you had with the data warehouse, you kind of lost them. So in particular, since you just dumped all your data there, you lost this pristine data with the control and the schemas on it, and this data now is inconsistent. It might be dirty, it might not be... Uh, throughout the petabyte of data set, you can't just rely that it's just going to work, so it's hard to build analytics on top of this data. Even basic analytics is hard, let alone advanced analytics. Um, and finally, the performance is actually really bad because you've just dumped the data in there. It hasn't been optimized for your particular use case. So a lot of companies are seeing that once they start building the applications on top of the data lake, they don't get the performance that they were getting from the data warehouses earlier. So, in short, you've got a messy data store with really poor performance. So, that's what the data lake looks like. So, what are enterprises doing today? Which one of these have they chosen? So, I want to talk about the current state that we're seeing in enterprises over and over again. And in particular, I want to focus on one particular use case at the Fortune 100 company. It's an InfoSec use case. This is a company that takes all of the connections that are happening on their network between any two devices, and they're storing it in a Hadoop data lake. So this is billions of records a day that are coming in. And they want to detect intrusions, they want to have alerting, and they want to build their sims uh, on, on top of this. So they stored it in the data lake, but it turned out that this data was actually messy, and it was hard to actually build these use cases on top of it. So what they ended up doing is they have the data lake with all these billions of records a day, and then they ETL all of this data, using Spark actually, over to multiple different enterprise data warehouses. So this, we see this picture over and over again. Companies that have multiple data lakes and lots of enterprise data warehouses, and they have to sort of ETL things and move things around between these. So now with these three enterprise data warehouses that I have, they've built incidents, response, reporting, uh, alerting on top of the data lake. But this architecture that they have has a lot of disadvantages. First of all, it has all those flaws that I said the enterprise data warehouses have, which is since it's costly to scale, they actually only have two weeks' worth of data in this enterprise data warehouse. 
which means they can't access all the intrusions or all the attacks that have happened in their system. It's also really expensive to scale the system, and as I said, it's proprietary formats, uh, and it's hard for them to do any machine learning on top of it, so they're just running SQL queries on top of these enterprise data warehouses. So the architecture that they've ended up with actually has poor agility, so they can't really respond to new threats because they can't do machine learning, and it has scale limitations. Uh, they have no historical data. It was limited to this two weeks of data, and it actually took them six months to build this. They had a team of 20 people that actually built this very complicated, large architecture. So today, I'm really, really excited to announce Databricks Delta. It's the first unified data management system that unifies data warehousing with uh, data lakes. In particular, it gives you the scale of the data lake, it gives you the reliability and performance of the data warehouses, and it gives you the low latency that you get out of real-time streaming engines. So Databricks Delta gets the good of the data lakes, which is it gets that massive scale. You store your data just on blob stores like S3. It's based on open formats, so Parquet and ORC. You can just have your data in those formats that you can read elsewhere. Uh, but you can also do predictions, machine learning, and real-time streaming with it. But in addition to that, Databricks Delta stores control data and makes sure that your data is reliable so you get the good of the data warehouses as well. So we try to keep your data really pristine in Databricks Delta. We give you transactional reliability so that you don't get failures, you just have atomic transactions, and you get really fast queries. There's a lot of optimizations that go into this data when you move it into the system. So we see anywhere between 10 to 100x speed up over just if you took just Apache Spark and ran it on a traditional data lake yourself. So in short, it enables predictions, real time, and ad hoc analytics at massive scale. So I mentioned it had these properties, massive scale, reliability, performance, and low latency. How are we doing this? So I want to mention a little bit about how we achieve these uh, four properties. The massive scale comes from the fact that we decouple compute and storage. So it's not coupled uh, appliance like traditional data warehouses. Instead, your data is stored on a blob store like S3, and you don't, you don't have to pay a lot for that. These blob stores are quite cheap today. Independently, you can scale your compute as you need. So as more and more people use the system during the day, it automatically scales up and down, so you get this elasticity. So that's how we get massive scale. Reliability, that's through asset transactions and data validation. We actually validate your data when it comes in so that it actually follows the schema. And if it doesn't, we actually reject it and give you a chance to fix that. And then for performance, we've actually added the traditional data warehousing techniques into Databricks Delta so that we do indexing and caching of your data. That way we can get the 10 to 100x speed ups that we're seeing. And then finally, where we spent a lot of our time is this whole system is based on structured streaming from Spark. So you get the real time streaming in jest that uh, Spark provides to you. So if we return to the use case that I mentioned, the Fortune 100 company, they've actually been using Databricks Delta now in production. And what they now do is they have now, instead of billions of records, they have tr trillions of records coming in every day and it comes straight into Databricks Delta, where it gets ETL'd in, and we do the schema validation right there, so we make sure that the data is correct and pristine, and we store all the indices that we need to speed it up. And then you can use Databricks Runtime and Spark to do SQL, machine learning, and streaming use cases. So what they ended up with by doing this is an AI-capable data warehouse at the scale of a data lake, and in particular, they can do now interactive analysis on two years' worth of data. So they can actually go back and analyze all the data that they stored, not just the two weeks that they had in the previous architecture. And this whole thing took two weeks to build with a team of five people. So instead of six months and a team of 20, uh, they could do it uh, with fewer people in faster time. OK, so I want to take a step back. So at previous Spark Summits, we've talked about the unified analytics platform that Databricks provides to its customer. And in particular, we focused a lot on the notebooks, the dashboards, the reporting that we had. We focused a lot on the collaboration to bridge the skills gap. Today, with Databricks Delta announcement, we complete this architecture now to have unified data management plus unified experience across the teams. Now you get reliable transactions and great performance together with those collaborative tools that the unified analytics platform uh, gives you. OK, so enough talking by me. Uh, I'm going to invite to stage Michael Ombrust, who is the mastermind behind Databricks Delta and many other things in Spark, such as SQL and the structured streaming engine. And he's actually going to do a live demo of this. So, you know, fingers crossed, and let's welcome Michael to stage. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ali. I'm super excited to be here today to demonstrate just how much Databricks Delta can simplify a lot of the complexity that sneaks in when you try to build real-world production pipelines. However, before I want to get into that, I want to start by looking at what it looks like when you build a cutting-edge pipeline today using the state-of-the-art tools. So, in, in particular, what I want to talk about is one use case that's really near and dear to my heart, the pipeline that I built at Databricks in the early days to understand how our users were using our cloud platform. So this architecture looks probably a lot like things that you guys have built at your companies. There's a bunch of events coming in from Kafka. In this case, it's logins to Databricks, clicks on features, Spark jobs running, things like that. I want to archive it into a data lake, and I want to be able to do streaming analytics so I can understand what's happening now in real time in production. And I also want to be able to run historical reports where I can look back and see what the trends are and how usage is changing over time. So let's see kind of what it looks like, how this system evolves. So, you know, I, as Ali said, I've been working on structured streaming recently, so let's start with that part. So it's pretty easy with Spark to, uh, you know, we've got great Kafka bindings. You can read data from Kafka, you can parse out the JSON, and you can run a bunch of queries. You can get streaming visualizations and set up alerts and all those other kinds of things. So that's pretty easy. Uh, but what's next? So, you know, now I, I also want to be able to answer queries uh, historically. And this is really where streaming-only systems start to fall short. Uh, Kafka is really good at storing a day or a week of data, but if you want to store years of raw events, you're going to need to use something else. So I've heard of this thing called the Lambda architecture, so maybe we'll kind of duplicate the code, and we'll have two different pipelines here. This is a, a little bit of extra work, but you know, Spark makes it easier because I can at least reuse the code from streaming in batch because it's the same APIs. So, okay, we've got the Lambda architecture, and now I've got stuff in a data warehouse. And now it's easy for me to do reporting with Spark, kind of the same data frames, data sets, and SQL. So what's next? Messy data. It turns out there's tens of engineers across a bunch of different teams putting events into this Kafka stream. So some people decide to use a different date format. Some people misspell event names. And so we need to have something to check and catch this when it happens in production. So we'll go and build some more Spark jobs that do validation. And it's kind of annoying. We've got to check both the streaming version and the batch version again. But, you know, we can do it. And so, you know, now we've added manual validation. So the next question is mistakes and failures. That validation is great, but it's actually too late by the time it's gone off. You know, that bad data has already been produced. It's in the data lake. And so we need some way to correct it. And this is actually pretty difficult, especially in a distributed system. It's not only human errors, but it's, you know, the spot price has spiked and my cluster died and half of the results were written out, and now I have to clean it up. So uh, a pretty typical technique here is you actually partition it by some granularity, let's say by date or by hour. And so now I have these nice clean boundaries, and I can build a bunch of infrastructure that allows me to do reprocessing. So I can kind of, if anything goes wrong, I can fix the mistake and then just go back and reprocess that whole day's worth of data. It's fairly coarse grain, but I, I guess it works. So we've added reprocessing into this. And now my users come to me and they say, this is way too slow. So we kind of start looking at it. Well, what's wrong here? Uh, so it turns out, you know, the streaming ingest was running really fast, but it was generating millions of tiny files on S3. So let's build some more Spark jobs that will do compaction. So we're going to run these. They're going to take those tiny files and write out nice, giant, gigabyte-sized Parquet files, columnarly encoded, super fast to read. Um, but then, oh man, that job happened to run while my reporting was running, and it crashed because now we got file not found exceptions. So we have to be really careful, and we have to schedule it so that we don't run compaction at the same time as reporting. And so now we've got compaction. OK, so this is a pretty complete pipeline. And the funny thing is, I've actually seen this exact same story play out hundreds of times. In fact, we built it at Databricks four different times. So let's see how it's different with Delta by going to a demo. So here I am in Databricks Notebook. I can run commands on my Spark cluster. Uh, and I'm going to start by actually creating a Delta table. So we can do that using standard SQL DDL. So we'll do create table events. And we'll say using. Delta. And this is going to be more than just a pointer in the Hive Metastore. I actually want this to be a contract. So we're going to specify the schema, and we're going to say both what my users of this table can expect to find, as well as what I'm going to mandate that people who are producing data, you know, the rules that they're going to follow. 
So we'll say there has to be a date, and it's going to be of type date. And we'll actually even say it's not null. So it has to be a valid date. You can't put garbage in here. Uh, we'll say there's an event, event type, and that's a string. And we'll also have a city, which is also a string. Cool. So we'll go ahead and run that command. It's going to go off in the background. It's going to initialize this table, creating kind of all of the, the transactionality and stuff that we need. So now that we've got the table, let's actually try loading some data into it. So let's start with that Kafka data. So we'll just do spark read stream Kafka, and we'll tell it which topic to read from. So we'll read from the topic events. And so this, is, this will give us a data frame. And if we take a look at this, it's got kind of the standard Kafka schema. We've got a key and a value. And we've got a whole bunch of metadata about exactly which broker this is coming from. Now, I happen to know that the value has JSON encoded data that has all the stuff that we need. So we'll just go ahead and do select value. And we'll do write stream into table events. So this is going to kick off a Spark job in the background. It's going to run a whole bunch of tasks in parallel, reading from Kafka, parsing that JSON, encoding it as Parquet, and committing it into the warehouse. And uh, you know, what we'll, we'll actually see is here it goes. It's actually running you know, tens of thousands of records per second. Pretty cool. So now that this is loaded into Delta, it's very easy for my users to do analytics on top of it. All I have to do is write some more SQL. So we'll do, uh, let's figure out you know, how the number of events has been changing over time to see if usage is growing or shrinking. So we'll do select count star uh, date from events, group by date, and order by date. So this is going to kick off another stream in the background. And you'll notice my users here don't have to know that this data is coming from Kafka or if it's from, coming from Kinesis or how to parse it or how to read JSON. All they have to do is write SQL. And so we immediately get something that we can turn into a visualization. And we've got this actual streaming visualization that's being updated in real time. So if you look at this axis here, you'll see every couple of seconds it bumps up as more events are read in. So that's pretty cool. Um, but actually, this graph is pretty boring. It doesn't really mean anything to me that we have this many events today, unless I can see it in the context of everything that's been happening over the last year. And this is where the fact that Delta integrates with both streaming and batch becomes very useful. So fortunately, we've actually archived all of the historical records uh, on S3. So we've got a bunch of JSON out there. So I'll just do uh, spark read JSON, and we'll do mount historical. So we'll read from that historical bucket. So this is going to pull up another data frame. And if we take a look at it, we'll see that we have the date and the event type in the city. That's exactly what we need. So I'm going to go ahead and do write to run a batch job. And we'll write it into table events. So this is going to be a much bigger job than that Kafka uh, stream that we're running up above, because it actually needs to process quite a bit of data. If we pull this out, you can see it's split it up into 800 different tasks. And it's running hundreds of them in parallel. And so it's you know, chugging through here, doing the conversion. And oh, man, it failed. OK, so at this point, if I was using a traditional system, I'd probably have to worry about the fact that 380 tasks already finished. They probably put garbage out there. I need to start over. But fortunately, this whole system is transactional. So it's either everything's going to happen or nothing's going to happen. So you'll notice nothing has happened up here. So let's see if we can fix this error. It looks like somebody back in September decided to use this silly American format for dates. Uh, so <laughs> let's see if we can fix that. Uh, so it's pretty easy with the data frame API. I'm just going to do with column date, and I'm going to use the SQL function called coalesce. And what this does is it just takes the first valid value that comes out. So we'll try uh, you know, taking the date and just casting it as a date. And we'll also try doing to date, where we take it and do date. And then it looks like it's month, month, day, day, Year, 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 year. And let's try this again. So now it's going to go again and kick off this batch job. It's running a whole bunch of stuff in parallel. So what it's actually doing is it's reading this JSON from S3. It's parsing it using JSON. It's applying my extra date format logic on top of that. And once the entire job completes, it's going to then make a you know, commit to this table so that it transactionally adds all of that data. So it's finished. And now it's actually committing it. And bam. And shortly, we should actually see all of that information appear up here. 
pretty cool. So let's actually take a look at this. I think this is one of the coolest parts here. You know, a streaming-only system can handle tens of thousands of records per second, but one of the really nice things about Delta is because it's built on top of Apache Spark's tungsten execution engine. You can actually, when you have a huge backlog of data suddenly show up in the system, we switched into this massive processing mode where you're processing hundreds of millions of records per second. Pretty cool. So, okay, so that's pretty great. We've got our streaming analytics, um, but I want to talk a little bit about the performance of ad hoc queries as well. We talked about the small files problem, and it turns out Tahoe is automatically doing compaction under the covers. So I want to talk about something a little bit harder, something that was typically reserved only for data warehouses. So if I were running a query like this, where I say, uh, let's say, select star from events, where city equals, and let's do uh, Dublin. So this query it actually doesn't need to read the entire table. It could touch a relatively small amount of it. And uh, so let's run it. I'm going to run it through this debug mode so we can actually see what's going on under the covers in the query planner. Um, but you know, in a normal Spark job, we would still have to scan the entire table to find you know, which data ha came from the city Dublin. But what, Tahoe is, or what Databricks Delta is doing under the covers is it's actually maintaining statistics and an index that, uh, that allows us to skip and read only the data that's necessary. So in this case, you can see there's 952 files in the, in the data set, but it actually dropped almost all, all but one of them, which is pretty cool. That can really speed up your, your ad hoc queries and, and reporting when you connect to tools like Tableau. So that's pretty cool. So let's, let's kind of review what we've done by going back to the presentation. Anytime. <laughs> so we started off with this really complex pipeline where I had to manually handle unifying streaming and batch. I had to do manual validation. I had to worry about the logic and kind of the boundaries at which I was doing reprocessing. I also had to handle compaction. Databricks Delta acts as this unified store where I can take data from a variety of sources, whether it's Kafka or a data lake or Kinesis or whatever, I can put it there and then all of my users can read it kind of with the strong guarantees of a data warehouse. But really the nice thing here is we still maintain the scale of a data lake, we have transactions so we get reliability, we have indexes so we get performance, and it integrates deeply with Spark so we can do low latency streaming. So if you think this is pretty cool and you'd like to try it out, I'm really excited to announce that we're opening it up for private beta. You can find out more at databricks.com slash delta. Thank you very much. <laughs>